Okay, let's get started. Good morning. A uh, couple of issues. I uh, about ten minutes ago, I posted the um, the whole explanation of the first project. It's on, on online right now. Um, so, any particular questions at this point in time regarding the project? No. So well, what I'm going to do today is exactly quite important. Uh, the lecture of today is kind of at the core of what the project is all about. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time about talking about designing adders. And uh, you may, may ask yourself, what if adders do with the project? I haven't seen an adder in there. But actually, you will see that virtually all functions that you're going to implement are very much like adders. So they're key uh, to the whole project. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, for those of you who haven't picked up the midterms yet, I brought some with me, the ones that haven't been handed out yet, so you can pick them up at the end of the lecture. Okay, so um, so today, basically, topic is adders and multipliers. And by the way, projects are finished. No more projects. Uh, sorry, projects. Um, labs are finished. So no more labs. From now on, it's, uh, you're on your own. So uh, in terms of the lab time, um, I discussed this with Ricky and Wen. And while the project is running, what's going to happen is that the room where you typically have the labs will be available. You have the machines there. And at last hour, uh, Ricky or Wen will be there if you have questions regarding the project. So to help you if you're stuck somewhere or you need some help with layout or whatever it is or simulation, they will be there at the last hour of that lab time. Okay? But that's basically your time to use for the project. All right. So um, let me just repeat a couple of things about the project that are important to remember. So um, what we're doing is, as I said, you're going to design a basic cell, or actually a number of basic cells. They're going to be used to implement the function of this neural associative memory. Okay. So um, the key thing I'm going to ask you in phase one, what do you have to do is a couple of things. Um, that you have to kind of think about. Number one is logic design. You have a set of equations there. How do you implement those? Um, what are the Boolean expressions that are going to implement this function? How can I manipulate this Boolean expression in such a way that I'm going to get a better result? And I'm going to talk about the better result, what that means in a minute. So, but that's step number one, is kind of get yourself familiarized with how to implement that particular function. The second thing, while you're doing so, you have to keep in mind somewhere the overall architecture of your memory. As I mentioned, what we want to do is minimize the amount of work you have to do. So, trying to make every cell in your memory different is not a good idea. What you would like to do is keep the same cell over and use it over and over again. Okay? So you will see, obviously, that the ones that go in the memory array might be different or will be different than the one that's going to be sitting on the side where that encoder sits. The encoder takes the outputs of the memory array and translates outputs the address that gives you the minimum value or the minimum distance value. So you need at least two cells. You might need a little bit more, uh, depending on if you want to optimize a little bit further, you will see that occasionally you might want to have two different memory cells. Uh, but that's up to you to decide. Okay, so logic design is number one. Once you've done your logic design, we're going to have to optimize it for delay. Now you may ask yourself, well, delay is not the key purpose of this project. It really is about area and energy. But in phase one, we're going to look at, you will see actually that the critical path. First thing you're going to do, obviously, when you've done your logic design, you're going to determine the longest path through the array, because that's going to determine your delay. And then the next thing you're going to do is start manipulating that critical path in such a way that you optimize it, minimize the delay. And you don't optimize it, you minimize it, actually. As I said, you, you, we're not primarily worried about delay, but you will see that the critical path is going to be very long. It's going to meander back and forth to your memory. So it's going to be a very long critical path. Now, if I want to minimize energy, one of the key tricks is to reduce supply voltage. 
and then if you want to reduce supply voltage after your delay goes up so actually having a start a delay starting with a design where you have minimized the delay is always a good starting point because then I can trade off delay for energy depending on how much slack and room we have left in the end so that's really what we're after in this case here we're gonna use logical effort and all the things you learned to minimize that very long critical path and feel free to change your equations, manipulate the equations, do things in such a way that you can have an impact on the overall delay of your circuit. And again, at the same, the side thing is we want to minimize area as well. And minimize area means that you're going to keep a very regular structure. You're not, um, we're not going to basically allow wiring to happen all over the place. We're going to make sure that you have mostly communications with your neighbors, neighboring cells. You don't want to have wires that go all the way around the memory from left to right. You don't want to do that. Okay. So if you look in the project definition uh, that's online right now, we give you a lot of numbers, a lot of information. So I think you should be all set to start running. Now, due date. Due date is just before um, spring break. So I believe it's on Wednesday. I mean, I've tried to remember the date of that. It's probably around the 20 something March. So it's, the, it's about, you have two weeks and a half time to do this. So due date, Wednesday, 5 p.m., just before the spring break. Okay? So obviously you will have questions, things will pop up, will be around, so you can ask at discussion sessions, time, as I said, during the lab time, you will basically, the TAs will be present, and so on and so forth. But you will see, it's, it's an interesting problem. There's a lot of flexibility. So the way you can implement these equations can be quite variable. So there's a lot of opportunity for you to be creative. And that's the real thing about design, being creative. Okay, question? So what exactly is due in two weeks? Two weeks, you're going to have to give a report of four pages. Page one is your name and who is in the team and things like that. That's about it. And overall, also the, the key result you got. What is my delay? Okay. Page two is a block diagram of your logic, explaining how your logic works. Now, instead of, um, I think we had said we have an array of 128 times 16, I believe. Uh, what we're going to ask you to design is actually a 4 by 16 array. Because you do 4 by 16, you can do the 128 as well. And it doesn't make any difference. It's just the same thing over and over and over again. So a 4 by 16 array, we want you to draw, draw out how you make the connections between the cells, what's in every cell. That's page 1, is your logic diagram, as you have optimized it. Uh, page 2 is showing the critical path and what you did to optimize that critical path in terms of logical manipulations. And page 3 is your optimization, what you did for how you sized the different gates in your array based on logical effort and how you basically think that gives you the minimum delay. So four page uh, project report. No more, no less. Um, I think you should be able to put the relevant figures in there. That's also, I'm gonna talk more about project reports um, uh, and what makes a good project report. That's important, actually 30% uh, of the grade will be on the quality of the report. So there's, uh, I believe there's, uh, if I look at it, there's 10% on creativity, I know that. There's probably 30% on correctness and methodology. And then there's about something about the results as well, if the results make sense or something like that. Or how you basically present how you got to the results. It's all defined in the, in the project definition. But it's basically, remember, 30% is going to be on report quality. How well do you present your data? And I'll talk more about that because that's an important thing. Um, it's an important part of any project is you might do the best job in the world, but if you cannot explain what you've done and how you got to your results, it's useless. So good reports are going to be essential in the rest of your life. Uh, whatever you do in the academic world, you have to write papers. In the uh, uh, industrial world, you have to uh, present your work to your uh, bosses and things like that, to the hierarchy management. So if you, again, if you cannot present it well, people won't listen. So uh, that's why in the third phase of the project, um, second, first and second phase is going to be based on a project report. Third phase, we're going to do a poster. 
where you have to explain it uh, vo verbally and basically what you've done and why you've done it and so on and so forth. That's another opportunity in terms of basically how do you present your results and how do you make it look enticing? How do you convince people that what you've done is the best thing in the world and nobody can beat you? That's always an important thing to do. Okay? All right, so that's where we're at. So due date is indeed Wednesday um, um, in 17, 18 days or something like that. All right, any other questions? So let me talk a little bit about adders. Adders are, as I said, they're really crucial. They're, if you look at arithmetic, and what you're going to be doing is arithmetic, right? You're going to compute distances, you're going to do comparisons, and so on and so forth. Um, turns out that the adder is kind of the critical element of anything that's arithmetic. And it's also the element that's going to set the delay of most of your arithmetic components. And the main problem with addition is the following thing. If I add two numbers, like you do it in, in, in decimal, right? Um, I, I add 175 and 389. Right. The way you do an addition typically is starting from the right side, the least significant uh, uh, digit, and you add the numbers together, five and nine, but you can see that you basically have an overflow. You get a 14. So what that causes is you have a four here, and then you take the 10 and move it on to the next bit or digit in this case. So you have now eight plus eight is 16. Once again, I have a one, a 10 that basically gets passed on to the next one. So you get two plus one plus three. So you get this effect that you kind of have information flowing from the right to the left. And that's gonna make it slow. Because in reality, if I want to make it fast, I would like to add all the digits at the same time. But you cannot do that because you have to wait for the first digit to finish before you can do the second one, before you can do the third one, before you can do the fourth one. This is what's called the ripple effect. And the ripple effect will cause, basically is the major cause of delay in adders and will be setting the speed of an adder. Okay. So that's really crucial, um, and how to deal with that ripple effect and how to minimize the impact of that ripple effect is what uh, drives adder design and what has made people think for a very, very long time about alternative ways of doing addition. Now you might say, well, it doesn't really matter if it's, if it's an 8-bit word, it actually doesn't matter that much. But if you start doing arithmetic, which has 64 bits or 128 bits, as we very often do in current day processors, then you can see that that ripple effect is going to be quite important. And it's going to dominate the speed of your computer. Okay? So that's, in the, uh, the, um, that's what's happening in the uh, decimal world. Now, obviously, in computers, we don't work with uh, decimals. We work with digits, uh, bi bits, um, zeros, and ones. In principle, there's no difference. If I do an addition in the zero, one space, it's very similar. Um, let's say I want to do... 0, 1, 0, 1, and have 1, 1, 1, 1, just to make life miserable. What you get here is two 1s together, that should be 2. 2 is 0, and you pass a 1 bit to the next one. We call this a carry. You carry over a bit to the next one. So here now I have 1 and 1, that's again 0. Now here next one I have 1 carry, plus a 1 plus a 1, that's 3. Means I have a 1 plus a carry. You get a carry here, that's a zero and a one. Right? So very similar. You do exactly the same thing. You add bit by bit, and you pass the carries over from left to right. Okay? So the basic cell, the nice thing about this, however, is that actually the same function for every bit, you're actually doing exactly the same function. I'm getting two input bits. Let's call this A and B. You get two input bits and you get a carry in, the carry from the previous bit. And the output is going to be a sum bit and a carry to the next bit. So a adder cell, any one of those logic cells I'm going to use here is a block that has two inputs, A and B. It has of bit I, it has the carry in of the previous one, it has a carry out, I, and it has a sum i output. So three inputs, two outputs, logic block. Now, 
Defining the equations for that, logic equation is not too hard, right? If, and from the time you start understanding addition, addition, you should be able to write down the logical equations. And then we can start manipulating those equations in such a way that we're going to make our block fast. Okay? So let's have a look at that. So this is your basic block. Two inputs, A and B. A sum output, a carry in, and a carry out. Now let's think about this sum bit. When is the sum bit going to be 1? What's the condition for an output sum bit? Yes? That's correct. So it's an odd number of 1s. If you have three inputs, they carry in, A and B. If you would have an even one, they basically add up and they become 0. Or you have none of them, they become 0. So what function implements a odd number? What would you use to... To do that, yes? XOR. It's an XOR. So the carry out, the sum, sorry, sum is basically A XOR B XOR CI. Okay? So you, this already shows why XORs are important. Where people spend so much time thinking about XORs, XORs are a crucial function in the implementation of any adder. So fast XORs is something we worry about. Okay, how about the carry out? Two of them are one or three. If, if three are basically, so you can say you have A, B plus A, C, I plus B, C, I. That's two of them are one, and this automatically also covers the cases that you have three of them are one. So it's an OR function. So uh, this is nicely summarized, and that's always a good thing. I, the way I always play with these things is I write a true table, because the true table shows you a lot of opportunities to play around with the equations. So that's my true table, describing those functions. Now, as I said, the key thing you're worried about is that carry out. Right? Carry out is going to be the dominant factor. How fast can I get that carry out generated? Because that's going to go to the next bit, that allows you to start the next bit, and so on and so forth. So if I look at what I'm worried about in terms of delay optimization, yeah, A, B to sum is important, but not as important as A, B, and C, I to carry out. Because that's going to go to the next bit and then carry, out to the, carry into the carry out, carry into carry out, carry into carry out. That's really what I'm going to be worried about, the ripple effect. Now, there's a couple of things. If I look at this true table, there are certain things that I might observe. There are certain things I can tell you before the carry-in has arrived. I don't know what the carry-in is going to be. That's unknown. You have to wait till it arrives. But just looking at A and B, I already know certain situations that I can guarantee certain outcomes. And that's quite clear. If A and B are zero, the chance of a carry-out is going to be zero. Uh, there's no possibility. So you break that chain. We call this a kill or a delete. That's basically when both A and B are zero, we have a carry delete or carry kill. Similarly, if both A and B are one, we're guaranteed that we're going to have a carry out, independent of the carry in. So that's this condition here. We call this a carry generate. You generate a carry. Whatever happens. And then in all the other cases, if A and B are 0 and 1 or 1 and 0, then actually the equation is quite straightforward. The carry out is going to be equal to the carry in. You just take the carry in and you move it on to the next stage. So A and B, in principle, from the time I apply my, let's say, my 128-bit word, A and B are known instantaneously which means that I should be able already to do some computations before the carry arrives. And that's basically creating those generate, propagate, and kill signals. Actually, you don't need to kill. Once you have generate and propagate, or propagate and delete, you have sufficient. Okay? But so just already kind of thinking about the overall structure, plus playing around with the equation, we learned quite a bit already. So this is is what we already have defined. 
The sum is the XOR of A, B, and CI. The carryout is the OR function of A, B, B, C, I, and A, C, I. Okay? All right. Good. I take that. Now, remember, this is just summarizing what we already said. This is the way you would build. Oh, by the way, that basic cell I showed you, the one with the three inputs and the two outputs, we call this a full adder. I forgot to mention that. Full adder. There's also something which is called a half adder. A half adder is an adder where the carry in is zero, when you don't have a carry in. And you can see that, suppose I have a four bit addition here. I have four full adder cells and I put them in a sequence, in a, in a row. The first bit is going to be zero. There's no carry in in the first bit. So in this case, carry in is going to be equal to zero. You can simplify the logic a bit. That would be a half adder here. You don't need a full adder. You can save some overhead or some area by doing so. But the key thing that you will just say, this will say, if, if you look at this ripple effect and you look at the overall delay, what is going to be the delay of an adder? Just at the overall picture. Well, I have a number of uh, delay elements. If I take my basic cell, you have three inputs and two outputs. Okay? So um, the delays we can define are the delay from A, B to C out, from C in to C out, from A, B to sum, and from carry in to sum. These are all the delays that I can define. Like we have defined propagation delay, 50% to 50% point. You look at the logic and you define the delay. So if I would look at the delay of this full adder, I can express it as a sum of delays of the basic elements. So actually, if you want to do it correctly, you say, well, the delay is going to be, first of all, the worst case condition, obviously. You have to always look at the worst case condition. Remember that? The worst case critical path is you choose the bits in such a way that the longest path is basically triggered. And the longest path, obviously, is when I have a carry generate at bit zero. I basically, for instance, A and B are one. Right? You have a carry generate at bit uh, zero, and then this thing propagates all the way to the last bit, and then finally it goes to the sum. That's my longest path. Now, obviously, you have to choose A and B, all the bits, in such a way that, indeed, bit 1 and bit 2 are going to be in propagate condition. And bit 3 should obviously, that doesn't really matter there, is what the sum delay. So actually, if I look at the exact expression for an n bit, n -bit adder, you can say that TP at is going to be equal to T P, or let's just go, you write A, just make it easy, A to C out, or B to C out, they're the same, they should be symmetrical, A and B don't matter, A to C out, plus N minus 2 times delay from CI to CO, plus T from CI to S, right? You have the first delay from A and B to the carry, then you ripple to n minus two stages, and then finally you generate the sum of the last bit. Okay? And that would be your typical delay expression. So the important thing to observe here is that the delay is a linear function of n. Right? If I increase n, I double n, you will see that your delay will approximately double. Because this middle factor here is the dominant factor. The TACO and TCI to S don't matter that much. Okay? So bottom line is I look at optimization of an adder. What should I worry about is TCI CO. That's the one I'm going to worry about. The other ones only occur one time in my delay equation, so I'm not going to basically spend a lot of time on that. Is that clear? Okay. All right. So we know how to do logic design. I have the equation, so what you would do right away I'll come back to that later. No, actually, it's worthwhile doing this before I go to the uh, circuit design. Uh, remember the generate and propagate and kill signals? So the generate, we, gen we agreed to the fact that the generate was A, B. When A and B are high, you have a generate of a carry. When A and B are low, you have a kill or a delete. And you have a propagate when 
A or B is high, X or A and B. One of the two is high, you're going to have a propagate condition. So what we can do is define two intermediate signals, G and P, at every bit. And remember, G and B are only a function, G and P are only a function of A and B. Right? They're not a function of the carry. We can compute them right away. You apply the input bits, you can compute right away A and B. Uh, sorry, G and P. And then, actually generating the sum and the output is actually quite straightforward. We can now rewrite our equations, and that's something we're going to use quite often when we implement adders. Rather than using A's and B's, directly now we first compute G's and P's, and then uh, ex implement some extra expressions that will basically uh, generate for us the carryout and the sum. Actually, the carryout, when will we have a carryout? Well, you have a carryout when you have a generate, guaranteed, right? Or when you have a propagate condition and the carry in is equal to one. Okay, so that's a new expression for the carry out. It's a function of G and P, which we can pre-compute. And the only thing we have to do is wait for CI to come in and we can actually feed this thing almost directly to the output with this AND function here. And then generating the sum is quite straightforward. Actually, this is a propagate condition, which is an XOR. X dot of CI, you get the sum. So once you have the in, 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 in carry, incoming carry, we can compute the sum quite rapidly. So that's a useful expression to have. It rewrites the equation a little bit, but allows us to focus primarily on that carry in, carry out path. G plus P times CI is kind of the key equation for the implementation of the carry path. Okay? But as I said, let's, uh, let's move a little bit to um, the uh, implementation and uh, start thinking about how you would implement a full adder cell. Now remember the equations. Um, we have for the sum, the sum is e the, the uh, carry is equal to um, AB plus ACI plus BCI. Let's carry out. So that's the one I'm primarily concerned about. Yes, I can do the sum generation, but that's not as critical. So I'm not going to worry too about the budget. If I want to do sizing optimization, I always care first about the one that's critical. So the critical one is this path from CI here to CO. That's what I'm worried about. I want to make sure that this is as fast as possible. So as you can see here, this is exactly an implementation of a, B plus C, I times A plus B. It's the same expression that I just wrote out here. Uh, using complementary logic, you have your PMOS network. And darn, this is a non-inverting function, which is a problem. I need an extra inverter, which is kind of painful. It means that I have to inject another inverter in my chain to make things faster. Uh, to make it work correctly. Sorry, it's not making it faster. So this takes 28 transistors. For the whole set of equations, you also can do the sum, which is this XOR. You actually can rewrite a little bit where you take the X signal and use this to save some gates. Right? All right, so if I look at this and I'm trying to figure out what the logical effort is, okay? Logical effort of A, B, and C, I. So that's always a good thing to do. The first thing I, I would basically look at you need look at branching factors, you look at logical effort numbers. Okay? So what's the logical effort for this first gate here? Well, we see CI. Uh, a and B are the same. They have the same load. So we first have to do sizing. From a sizing perspective, we're going to make this thing 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. And this one here is going to be 4, four, four, eight, eight, All right? Simplify uh, sizing to make sure that my resistive paths are basically equal under all conditions. Now, what does that mean? If I look at my input A, A has um, two plus two plus four plus eight. Uh, that's four, eight, 16 over 3. Logical effort for A is 16 over 3. You see what I'm doing? I uh, take A here, A here, 
There's another A here, another here. 12 plus 4 is 16. Same for B. That's high. Now look at the input carry. That's a little bit better. The input carry only connects to two points. That's going to be 6 over 3 is equal to 2. Which is already nice, right? Because the, we are mostly concerned about the input carry. So this is going to be the one that's going to dominate our delay. Okay? But remember that. Uh, pretty bad from an uh, input A and B to output perspective, but quite good from a logical effort perspective for the carry. But still, 2 is too high. And the other factor that we're going to take into account yet, I'm adding some fixed propagation delay uh, as, uh, because we have that extra inversion here. That already is going to hurt us as well. So we would like to get around with this. So the question is what I can do is maybe reorganize my transistors a little bit, shuffle them around in such a way that I come up with an adder structure which is a little bit more effective. Right? So here's an example of how to do this. It's kind of interesting structure. Um, it might strike some things. Um, if you look at this logic structure, it's called a mirror adder. Um, now, why would you call this a mirror adder? Well, actually, if you look at this line here, and you look around the line, you can see it's exactly the same thing in the PMOS network and the NMOS network. So this is, this is obviously somewhat different that we're used to in the, uh, for our uh, CMOS, traditional CMOS network, where you have to create complementarity. Parallel becomes serious, serious become parallel. We don't do that here. You just look at the expression, and what we did here is, again, you look at your truth table, and you want to make sure that you cover all roads of the truth table. And can I make something that's a little bit more effective while doing so? And the answer is yes. So if you think about it, if you have A and B high, we have A, obviously, a generate. If A and B are kill, uh, are, are zero, we have a kill. So this is the generate, this is the kill signal. And then, when A or B, one of the two, is high, we're going to have a propagate condition. So if the carry in is 1, we see that if A or B is high, we're going to enable this thing, one of the two, A plus B, this carry in will basically move forward to here. When the carry in is 0, we're going to move and propagate it to the PMOS. So this implements the propagate condition. So this is the P network. And what it really implements is A, B, a plus B and CI. Okay? So we took them apart and we implemented both those functions in such a way they have pure complementarity. This is the kill, generate, and this is the propagate for CI low, CI high. And if you would fill this into your truth table, you will see that you perfectly cover every single row of the truth table. Now, the advantage of this is already that you can see that life is better. We don't have this very complex network anymore. If you look at the previous adder, we had a stack of three transistors here, three PMOS devices, which was not very nice. That cost us. So here, if I look at the sizing, this can be two, two, four, 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 two, two, two. What I basically managed here is to reduce the logical effort of A and B substantially. Now, that might not matter, matter that much because you obviously can say, gee, C in to C out is still 6. 6 over 3, I still have the same logical effort. But actually, I could do something different here. Nobody forces me to exactly size my transistors like this. Um, if I'm basically very clever, I might want to size the CI transistors smaller because the A and the Bs are already there. They're not arriving at the same time. So rather than doing this particular sizing effect here, no, what I could do is already kind of set. If A and B have already arrived way before, 
What is already going to happen if A and B are high or B are as high, then this node is already going to be at zero. The resistivity of this doesn't matter that much anymore. It's only this transist that matter. If you have a shift in time, the typical logical effort is assume that all inputs arrive at the same time. But if that's not the case, what I could do is say, well, gee, I'm going to make these things a little bit smaller, and I'm only going to worry about this component here. And I'm going to size my transistor to minimize the delay of that component. So how can you do that in right. So you can do some clever things. But ultimately, um, what this does is primarily reduce logical effort for the A and B inputs, if you would just do it straightforward sizing. But as I said, you can do some more clever things in such a way that you reduce the logical effort on your critical path. OK, there's other things I can do. So this is kind of purely playing around with transistor equations. I can do a lot more things that can help me to increase the speed of my adder. Yeah, yeah close the door. That would be a good idea. So one thing I observed is that my carry path is a non-inverting path, which is kind of annoying uh, because I always have to introduce that inverter. And you might say it doesn't add to the logical effort. No, it doesn't. But it adds a fixed propagation delay. You always have that intrinsic propagation delay sitting there, and I would like to get rid of that. I want to go faster. Now, there's some interesting properties of a full adder cell. If I take a full adder cell, as is written right here, and I decide to invert all the inputs, instead of applying the inputs, I apply the inv input invert, A bar, B bar, and CI bar. What's happening is it's, this equations are quite interesting. It turns out that what you get at the output is CO bar and S bar. So you invert all the inputs, and automatically what happens at the output is that uh, the, you get the same equations, really, implemented. But S, at the output now we get S bar and CO bar. So CO bar is equal to CO, A, B bar, C bar, bar, and vice versa. Now you say, why is this interesting? Well, no, think about it. Suppose I take a full adder cell and apply CI. Typically, it would get out of this CO. But if I eliminate one of those inversions, that inverter that sits on the critical path, I say, I don't want to implement it. What I get is CO bar. Now, rather than putting an inversion in between and get the right signal, I can feed this right away into a next. One second, let me just clear this up. So you have this, you get CI. CO bar. I'm going to feed this right away into one of those inverting cells. I, I basically imply CO bar here. Instead of AB, I do A bar and B bar. What I get out of here is going to be, once again, CO non-inverted. So by playing that inversion thing, trick that I know here, I can eliminate all those inverters on the critical path. I just have to make sure that I put some inversions at the inputs every other bit. So the way you do that, you implement this as a little, it's a little bit more complicated now because instead of having something like this, where you have FA, 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 and FA, what I'm going to do is FA. Then at the second one, I'm going to do FA bar, a cell with inverted inputs. Then I go back to FA, and then I do FA bar. So you kind of flip, you have now two cells. Instead of having one cell, you actually have two cells. They're almost the same, but there's some extra inversions in there. So you do FA, you have the odd and the even cells. At the odd cells, you use FA. At the even position, you use the FA bar cell. And by doing so, just by Doing this, thinking about total system, I can eliminate all those inversions. That's a nice feature. So that's really what you get here. This is exploiting that inversion. So your even cells have an inverted, have the normal signals in. So these are the odd cells. The odd cells, or even cells, no, the, the even cells, sorry. This is even, zero, two, four, whatever. They have the non-inverting inputs and the, the outputs are CO bar and SO bar. 
So you have to have another inversion here to get SO. Next bit basically takes the inverted inputs and returns CO bar, or COO in the normal format. And then you have, again, an even cell, odd cell, even cell, odd cell. Is that clear? So by this, I have no more inversions or extra inverters on the critical path. I get rid of those. So that's nice. OK. So let's get back to my um, um, mirror cell here. So as we said, really what we care about is CI, and we know for CI that logical effort is about 2. Right? That's, we computed that. It's 2. Now, question now is how to size this. And that's a good question, right? We, we, the next question I would like to figure out, I know the carry out is uh, the logical effort is 2. How should we size the transistors A, B, and CI in such a way that have minimum delay? Okay? That's what we have to think about. Now, what we know is that the optimal fan out, or basically the stage effort, is equal to 4. Right? That's a given factor. We know that 4 is, if you really would like to have the absolute minimum delay, every stage should have a stage effort approximately equal to 4. We know the logical effort is 2. So how can we now size the whole structure in such a way that we're going to have a stage effort of 4? We have another factor of 2 approximately coming in. So that requires some interesting analysis here. Now it's a little bit more tricky. So here's, um, let's say, two bits of a mirror adder. You have to take into account branching factors. You have to take all those things into account, right? So there's branching, there's electrical effort, this, uh, and, and there's a logical effort. These are all the games at play. And we know stage effort should be equal to 4. We know that. And we know that logical effort is equal to 2. Now let's figure out what the branching factor is here. So here you have your basic carry generation. This is bit i minus 1. This is the next bit. I, these are the sum generation. Now if I look carefully... Oops, interesting, what's this? Hmm. I got something different on my screen. Go back, and see what it is. Hmm. Screen got confused. Let's see, no, it's fine. Okay, cool. All right, I got something different here than you saw. Um, anyhow, so if you look at what's hanging off this node here, what's the branching part? So you look at the output node, and what's going to be the fan out? So we have our basic gate here that we want to size. And we're going to look at the fan out. So you can see that the carry, this is my carry to the next bit, CCI. That's CCI in. This is where it goes. It goes to the next adder. It goes to the sum stage. And it also goes to the next sum stage as well. If you look at the input that we had, if you look at the expressions, I think right here, right here, you can see that uh, CI pops up in a number of places, also in the sum. So you have to take those into account. These are all branching factors that you have to take into account. So we're going to assume that we don't care about the delay of this sum generation. If you don't care about the sum generation, what you would like to do is minimize its capacitance. So we're going to make all those transistor minimum size. There's no reason whatsoever to make this larger. They're just going to make your carry slower. So I'm going to size them all minimally. So that's quite straightforward. If you have uh, for this part here, 2, 2, 2, for the PMOS network fours, this thing has a stack of 3, so you get 6, 6, 6, and 3, 3, 3. Okay? And the same thing here. So I can size all those. So now I can compute the total capacitance that hangs off this node. So we know that the input capacitance, we call the CCI, the input of the carry of this gate. So we know that. We want to look at the output capacitance. That's going to give you the total fan out plus branching factor. Okay? Well, you have 6 here. You have another 6 here. You have 9 here. And you have another CCI. It's a self-loading gate. It basically is loaded by itself for the next stage. So this carry in... If you size this, every stage in the same way, 
this has the input capacitance also appears in its output, right? Because that's you have your ripple chain. So your total load capacitance is going to be 6 plus 6 plus 9 plus CCI, right? 6 plus 6 plus here, 6 plus 6 plus 9 plus CCI is my load capacitance. Now, we know that we want to have, we have a logical effort of 2. We want to be at 4. So the total product of branching and electrical fan out should be equal to 2. So we know that C load should be equal to 2 times CCI for the optimal delay optimization, right? So now I have an equation that 2 CCI should be equal to CCI plus 12 plus 21. What this tells me is that CI should be equal to 21. I can solve that. Right? 2 CCI is equal to CCI plus 12 plus 9 plus 21. You drop one of those, so CCI is equal to 21. So from this I can solve for the optimum size of my transistors, those key transistors here in the, um, which basically translates into 7 and 14 because the PMOS has to be double the size. It's actually working out beautifully. It's quite amazing. So 7 and 14 are the sizes of that network. So you can carefully size the, uh, and then you have to decide obviously what you're going to do with the other one, but that's less important. So that's really what we're coming down to here. 7, 7, 7, 14, 14, 14. Logical effort of 2. This one, this one we're going to just do minimum size, 2, 2, 4, 4. There's no reason to make them larger. So you just use a minimum size. And the only one you really size up is where the critical path is. And that's the rule, right? If I want to do sizing, you always start with the critical path, and then you try to keep all the transits which are not as important, you try to keep a minimum size. Okay? So that's uh, an example of how you can play around with this. You have to start thinking, what, are you, what do I really worry about? How can I simplify the logic structure that in such a way that branching is minimized? How can I eliminate my extra inversions? And so on and so forth. So this is just an example of an adder implementation. There's many, 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 many more. People have, as I said, this is the most important logical element in any processor. It's going to determine your speed. So you can imagine that there's about a million papers about how to design an adder. People always come up with new ideas, a little bit different, and so on and so forth. But it's a very important topic because it pays directly back in performance for your processor. Okay? Now, so that's good. And we'll talk more about, I'll show you some other adder cells later on, but for the time being, that's fine. Um, to do. So a couple of things. So NMOS and PMOS for the middle round is completely symmetrical. We're okay. Maximum of two series transistors in a carry generation gate. That's important. No, no stacks of three. Uh, important. Oh, this is something I forgot to mention. Um, let me just kind of go back. And the kind of I alluded it to it already. Hmm. All right. Interesting. Oh, it, I have to be here. Okay. I already already alluded to this, but if I would have let's say a function, a mm, let me just take my pen here. Okay. I I want to implement the function. Let's say f equals a b bar. Okay, very simple, NAND gate. Implementation, we know something like this. PMOS, PMOS. Oh, let me just, yeah, there's no options here. Suppose now that A, they look, this looks completely symmetrical, right? So how I put, connect the inputs to the different transistors should not matter. Uh, where I connect A, where I connect B, it really should not matter. Right? However, suppose that A is on the critical path and B is not. Right? So um, you have, let's say, a, a, this is NAND gate, this is B, B is one of the primary inputs, but A comes from somewhere, has a bunch of gates in front of it. So this is the critical path. That's the one I want to optimize. B doesn't matter. The path from B to output is very short. So 
does it still, then you can ask yourself the question, is there an impact on how I connect the transistors in my gate to the inputs? Will that make a difference? I have two choices here. The top is easy, it's symmetrical. Uh, it's parallel, so it doesn't matter. But here I have two options. I do AB or AB. These are my two options, right? Either I connect A to the bottom transistor or to the top transistor. Now the question is, which one is better? Or does it make a difference? So what do you think? Yes? It probably makes a difference because your point is out. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Very clever. Yes, that's the obvious, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't talk about it. So I just randomly connect it, and you're done. OK, so that's observation number one. It makes a difference. Observation number two, which one would you choose? Would you put A on the top or on the bottom? Who thinks it should be on the top? OK, three. Who thinks it should be on the bottom? Two. And then the other one said it doesn't matter. Right? So, OK. Think about it. I actually alluded to it already. If I assume, let's assume there's a capacitance here. That's really what comes into the game. What makes the difference here? Suppose that I put A on the bottom. All right? B arrives. B is there already. So this transistor is going to be on or off. Let's assume that's on, that there's a 1 here. What's going to happen is that I'm going to close this transistor, and there might have been a previous value here. But there's no path to ground yet, because A might be still at 0. So this thing is floating. I'm going to charge this capacitor. I'm going to redistribute the charge between this capacitor. So I'm going to get some voltage on the top of A. It could be equal to VDD. You put a number at VDD. Worst case, this will be sitting at VDD. Then A comes in. And then what I have to do is take this total capacitance and discharge it to ground. Right? That's when A arrives. Bingo, A goes from 0 to 1. All the capacitance that's sitting on the output node has to be discharged. Let's now look at the alternative case. Let me kind of put it in red. So I'm going to put A on the top and B on the bottom. So let's erase this here and see what's happening. So B arrives first. So what's going to happen is that this transistor will close. B goes to 1. This capacitor already gets discharged. It's gone. So the only thing that happens when A goes from, A goes from 0 to 1, that I have to discharge the output capacitance to ground. So actually, the amount of capacitance that I have to deal with is actually reduced. So the rule is, it's a very simple rule. You always should connect the transistors that are critical or the inputs are critical, closer to the output. So the ones that are not critical, you put on the bottom, on the top. But the ones that are on the critical part, you want to be as close as possible to the output. So that's the rule. So A should be on top. And that's why if you notice what we did with the mirror adder, the carry in was just on the top. And A and B were already done. So it makes a difference. You wouldn't find it from logical effort, because logical effort doesn't take into account these intermediate capacitances. It's not included, so logical effort doesn't tell you anything about that. Okay? All right. Let's go back. For one reason or another, just decided to go all the way backwards. Okay. So, rules, completely symmetrical. Minimize the capacitance at node CO. Obviously, don't use big transistors and big areas. If you look at CO, you're going to be very careful on laying out the drains of your transistor in such a way that the diffusion capacitors are as small as possible. It's really important. That's where capacitance is going to come from. If you're not careful and you have a large diffusion area there, you're going to cost you. Carrier signals are critical, so the transistors connect to CI are placed closest to the output. And only in the transistor in the propagate carry chain have to be optimized for speed. All the other can be minimum size. So that's something you should remember when we start doing um, the circuits for our project. Okay. That's cool. 
we know how to implement an adder. We know it's linear in the number of bits and that we have to worry primarily about the carry chain. Bottom, however, is can I do better than that? That's what you always ask, right? To say, okay, that's what we got. Would it be possible to build an adder that doesn't have that linear dependency? That would be nice, right? If I can get around that linear dependency, I can build an adder with larger number of bits and the delay wouldn't go and double, let's say, with the number of bits. If I double the number of bits, that would be really cool. So this is the holy grail of adder design, is what can I do to make an adder that I minimize the dependency between the number of bits and the delay, or basically try to get something which is better than linear. Okay, you can be clever. So, remember we have talked about these propagate signals. That's a good thing to think about. Worst case is when a carry has to carry through this whole chain of propagates. Now you say, well, actually I can know this in advance. Right? Because from the time I have A and B, I can compute all those propagate signals. I'll know when there's going to be a propagate condition happening. Maybe I can do something around it. So this is a beautiful concept, which is called a bypass. And again, let me explain the concept of... Um, using um, a simple diagram rather than basically showing the diagram. So suppose you have a city. Driving to a city is kind of a problem, right? Every time you have to drive to a city, it is all traffic lights and things like that. So what have most cities done to avoid that? They put a, a bypass around it. If you don't have to be in the city, you just drive around it and you go to the next step. Right? Same deal here. Going to all those adder stages is kind of painful. If you know that you're going to have a set of propagates in a chain, I know that the input carry is going to go all the way to the output without a problem. I'm going to take a short, a short route and I go around all those intermediate things. So suppose I take an adder, and let's make it simple as a starter. Say I have four bits, um, four bit block. Right here. And this would typically be your added ripple condition. You would basically go to those four bits. However, this has a signal P0, P1, P2, P3, by propagate signals. If I know that P0 is 1, P1 is 1, P2 is 1, P3 is 1, then we know that an input carry will go all the way to the output without a problem. You don't have to wait for it, you don't have to compute it, you know. So what I could do is a very simple thing where I take my adder and I add a multiplexer in the end. And then I take my input carry and feed it to the output. And this is equal, the input to this multiplexer is P0, P1, P2, P3. So when P0, P1, P2, P3, let's call this the block propagate P, if the plot block propagate is zero, then you know there's no propagate condition. Somewhere here, you're gonna have to figure out what's happening in this block for the output to determine what the output propagate carry is gonna be. So you have to evaluate this block. However, if this is one, we know that the output carry here, C out, is gonna be equal to the carry that comes in here. I can just take it and move it on. We're done with it, move it on to the next block. Right? So if you now look at this as a strategy, what I can take, let's say I do a 16-bit adder, I can divide it in blocks of four and use that strategy. Now you have to be careful though, right? Because if I would to use too many bits in this propagate, this end gate will become too complex and will become slow too. That might become the dominant delay factor. So you have to make sure that you don't overdo it. You have to choose your block size of a certain, you have to optimize it. Okay, so that's what we call the carry bypass adder, as a bypass basically, what the word says. Now, key question is, when you look at this, is, is this thing gonna be defeating, the goal really is, can I make a faster adder with that? Question is now, does it speed up my adder as a function of the number of bits? And will it still be linear? Because remember, holy grail is something getting something that's faster than linear. Okay? So what do you think? Depends. Sorry? It depends. 
It depends. That's a, that's a dangerous answer to give, right? Uh, we have the same worst case scenario as we had before. Yeah, yeah. You you're right. So you're still going to be linear. The worst case is going to be better, right? So the worst case, remember, if I have 60-bit adder, what's the worst case is all my propagates are going are going to be one, except the first bit and the last bit. But you go from all the way through the chain, from left to right. If this is the case here, what I'm going to do is first four bits, oh, I generate a carry, right? The first block generates a carry. And then I go to the next block, but there I just right away go to this multiplexer. Because the propagate, these things are sitting there already. We have pre computed P0, P1, P2, P3. So my input goes in one shot to a multiplexer only to the next stage. And then the same thing again for the next block. And the same thing for the next block. So your critical path is going to be shorter. No question about it. Instead of having four propagate gates here, I have only one multiplexer gate. So we're going to be better. Uh, there's no question about that. The question is, how much better? Is it still linear? It is still linear, right? Instead of having now n gates in my critical path, I have n divided by four gates. You still have multiplexers. And I put more bits, I'm going to get more multiplexers. So that is going to help me. So but it's a good thing to observe. Um, so it's still linear, but it's going to be a better performance. And I'll show you in a second how, that, how much better that could be. So let me get back here. Right here. There we go. Good. OK. That's my bypass structure. So the basic idea I showed you is also called carry skip. Like skip block after block after block after block. OK. So the ID, if P0, P1, P2, and P3 is equal to 1, then CO3 is equal to CO, or C in, or whatever you call it, and, or else, kill or generate. Because that's really depending. Then it only depends if there's a kill or a, the carry up is only going to be one if you either have a kill somewhere. Uh, or a gener you have to have a generate somewhere in that block. If you wouldn't have a generate, you will never have an output carry. Okay. So this is the way I would implement this thing. So instead of having single bits, I divide it in blocks of n bits. 0 to 3, 4 to 7, 8 to 11, 12 to 15. And my delay is going to be no like this. My critical path is going to be the first block, obviously, we have now a next piece of logic here, which you call the setup logic. The setup logic is the things you do when A and B come in. You compute the P and the G signals. You can also do P0, P1, P2, P3. That's what setup is. It's basically pre-compute and wait for the carry. And then when the carry comes in, then I just propagate the carry, depending on what's happening. So my worst case condition is when I have a carry generate here, somewhere I generate a bit zero. This is going to propagate through this block. This is zero here, it doesn't matter. It's going to propagate to this block and start appearing here. And then from there on, it is just going to go like this. But finally, in the last stage, it has to go to the sum. OK? So that's your critical path now. So the advantage is that in the middle part of my adder, I have reduced the delay by a factor of four approximately. Let's put it this way, simply. I have one multiplexer instead of four carry in, carry out type of stages. Or four, or whatever M is. So now I can again write an equation for the delay. Obviously, I have first of all the setup. You have n minus 1 carry bits in the first block. And then I have a number of blocks to the bypass, to this multiplexer. And then finally, you have to have this final sum generation, which is going to require the carry to go all the way to the last bit, and then finally generate a sum. Because here I cannot use the bypass. I don't care about the carry out anymore. I care about what's the carry in the last bit so that I can compute the sum. So this block and this block we have to compute in full. All the other ones, we just zoom through. And you, you have to basically work a little bit on this. You will see there's no way it can be, uh, this is definitely for sure, the slowest path. Any other intermediate path will basically disable one of those multiplexers, and your longest path is going to be cut. Before that, it's going to be cut here. means I have a zero. If there's no propagate, we're going to have a, somewhere a generate coming from here. 
Okay? Bottom line still, this. N over M means that you're still linear with N, right? You still are linear function of the number of bits. Okay, that's good. It's better. So what I've done really is the following thing. If you look at the number of bits and you look at TP, for a typical adder, I might get something like this, right? You have a linear dependency in the delay versus the number of bits. What we've done here is maybe add a little bit of overhead, but we change the slope. That's kind of what you've done. You change the slope of the dependency. It's still linear, but it's flatter. So it means that for a larger number of n, I'm going to win. Maybe for very small bits, like say if I have four bit adder, it doesn't make any sense to do this. The overhead is going to be larger than the gain. Actually, you might, what do you do? Two blocks of two? It won't buy you very much because you have to compute that A, B function or P0, P1 function. It's going to be slower than the gain you're going to get. Okay? All right. Good. Does it mean that we always have to be linear? That's uh, first conclusion. Boy, we do a lot of work and we still have a linear adder. Can we do better? The answer is yes. So let's figure out another strategy here. If you look at a block, what I really care about is um, I, I, I have to wait before, let's say I have a block of four bits. Before I can tell you what the output carrier is going to be, I have to wait till the input carrier arrives. So that takes time. And then we, when the input carrier arrives, I have to figure out what to do with it. So here's an idea. Suppose I take a block of four bits and I don't know what the input carrier is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute both. I, I can say I'm going to assume a zero input carry and I'm going to assume a one input carry. I compute both. And then when the input carry arrives, I just have to determine which one to pick. So you pre-compute the result and then you pick what result you get as a result of the input signal. Again, it's going to be a multiplexer. Very similar. This. But so what I'm doing now here is I take my block and I have a carry zero propagation path and a carry one propagation path. Right? Out of this get a sum of signals which can tell me what the input output carry is and I can do the sum generation. So I implement two carry paths. One of them I assume that the input is going to be equal to zero, the other one I'm going to connect to VDD. Same thing. But out of this, I'm going to know what the input carry is and I can select with this multiplexer. And the same thing with some signals. So that's quite beautiful. Uh, it can be done. Obviously, it costs you some area because now I have, I have to replicate my carry propagation path. I have to do it two times. And then I basically put the multiplexer there and I basically go forward. Now, if I look at this, is, is that something which is a good idea or not? It's bigger for sure. Does it help me anything? If I look at that, it says, I take now a 60-bit adder and I divide it in four blocks of four, like we did with the select adder. Am I going to still be linear or am I going to be better than that? Linear, right? Doesn't change anything. You still have four multiplexers. Doesn't help anything. However, there's one subtle thing that you have to look at. The worst thing in logic is logic that sits there and doesn't do anything. It's waiting for its input to arrive. That's kind of a pain. Now, what we do, if you take your four blocks of four, right, this thing computes and computes its carry path, and this one, and this one, and this one. They're all sitting there with their results ready at the same time. And then you have to just wait for that carry to arrive and, and move on. So this thing is going to start first, and then this one is going to work, and then this one is going to work, and this one is going to work. But before that, block 2, 3, and 4 are going to be idle. They all have computed their carry output 0 path, carry output 1 path. They have all that thing sitting there, and they're just waiting for the thing to arrive. What does it say? Well, I can be clever in the sense. The cleverness is just why it's a waste that for all those blocks to sit there and wait for the thing to arrive. Maybe I can do a little bit more work. Rather than being all done at the same time, maybe I can do a little bit more work in big block two and even more work in block three and even more work in block four. How would you do that? Well, it's quite simple. If this thing is four bits, why not do five bits in block two? 
and six block bits in block two, and seven in block four. So you gradually increase the size of the blocks. And what this does is now that when they carry, you're going to make sure that your setup computation, your two critical path computation, is going to be done just at the time that the input carry arrives. You balance all the timing paths. You make them all equal length. Now, again, what does it help you? Well, if I make my subsequent blocks larger and larger and larger, I'm going to need less multiplexers. The number of blocks I'm going to need to implement a certain function is going to go down. And bottom line, suddenly I end up with something which is faster than linear. How will it behave? Well, we'll basically try to figure that out in a second. So this is the structure that I would have if I have a purely linear implementation. All the blocks the same length. Um, you have your zero carry, one carry, then you do the multiplexer, and the critical part is going to go multiplexer, multiplexer, multiplexer. And then finally, some generation. One subtle difference here also between the carry select, which is called this adder here, this carry select, and the carry bypass, is that here, you don't care about the delay. The critical path is only the multiplexer because your sum values and your carry singles are already pre-computed. You just have to select between one and two. In the other case, I still have to compute the last block. Here, I don't have to do that anymore because it's pre-computed for me. So that's an advantage, and it's going to make a very important difference in the end. So we said, this is still linear, no good. So let's do something like this. And, and this kind of shows it up, right? This is the linear thing. But if I would assume that every block has a delay of one, make life simple. I, I propagate, a sum bit generation is delay of one, a multiplex is delay of one, carry in, carry out is delay of one. Just simplify. All have a unit delay. So this is going to take me, my setup is going to be one bit. It's going to be delay of one. Uh, carry, four bits. You have to go to four stages, four bits delay. That gets you both of those things arriving at five. You go to multiplex, this is times six. This go to the multiplex times seven, times eight. As I mentioned, if you make all the blocks the same, this will also, all the singles here will be here at time five. All right? So this arrives at eight. The other inputs are already there since time five. They're just waiting. If I now would increase block two, by one bit, this will be arriving at time six, and the carry will be arriving at the same time as the input signals are basically valid. You add two more bits here, this becomes seven, and if you add three more bits here, this becomes eight. Right. So you balance the timing paths. Uh, that's what I show here. Bottom line is you're gonna use, use number of bits, a small number of bits, but the key factor is this one here. It says if you look at the delay expression, you do this, uh, you exp uh, manipulate it a little bit and so on and so forth. Uh, that's in the textbook actually, if you're interested in figuring out why, how it exactly works out. But the bottom line is that the propagation delay of this adder is a square root out of n. We beat the linear dependency. Okay? So we now have an adder where the delay, I might have a picture here, this is your ripple adder. That's a linear select. This is square root. Remember, if you look at a square root, it looks something like this. It flattens out. So if I go from 16 to 32 to 46, 64 to 128 bits, you will see that your delay doesn't increase that much anymore, which is very nice. Yes? What is that one subscript there? It looks like mux. Mux. That's the delay of the muxes. The, because that's really the critical part is square root of n maxes you need to implement a certain block. Okay? So that's cool. Now, I'm going to ask you a question here. So this worked for uh, the carry select. I said, hmm, uh, why didn't I do the same thing for my carry bypass? I could do the same thing, right? The carry bypass, we chose all blocks to be the same length. Why not make a carry bypass? where every block gets a little bit longer and a little bit longer and a little bit longer. Would that work? Would that basically help me to create a Gary bypass adder which is better than linear? Or not? What do you think? Uh, maybe I, I can go back a bit to the Gary bypass and the critical path of the Gary bypass. Remember the critical path is like this. 
it goes to the first four beds, then mux, mux, and last four beds. Suppose now I make this thing two bits, three bits, four bits, five bits, or something like that. Would that help? You still, yeah, you still have to do the, the propagate signals, right? But that's okay. Oh, 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 right, right. Yeah, this is with the propagate, right? So it's, there's no select here. This is just propagate. It's kind of written on, you can see it on the picture. Remember what I said? The key thing about the select adder, uh, for the bypass adder, is that in the last block, I still have to do a ripple because I have to compute. The, I have to get all the carriers before I can compute the sum. With the select, you pre-compute them. Here, you have to still and ripple through this whole block, and then you can get the sum output. So if I keep on, this is actually now starting to add, and, and make, this is going to increase and increase and increase. So if I keep on increasing the block size, this thing will become the dominant factor, and it's not going to help me anything. Actually, this is not a good idea. So still, though, it sounds like if I could, I still have a lot of waste, right? All those things are sitting here and waiting for the carrier to come in. So it would be nice if we can kind of balance the timing parts a little bit better. Actually, I'm not going to keep you in suspense. Um, and actually, it's quite straightforward. What are you going to do? Because if I make the last blocks too long, that's going to be dominating. So what I should do is make the last block small. Make the first block small. But I still want to do that timing part balance. So what I do is actually is gradually increase the block size, and then towards the end, I'm decreasing them again. So to make a better than linear carry bypass adder, I'm going to, let's say, starting with maybe, let's say, three bits on the first and last block, four bits, next blocks, five bits. Why do we come back down before the very end? Mm -hmm. Because of the fact that this thing here becomes a dominant factor. Well, no, I understand that we want the last stage to be like... It ripples forward. back. You will basically start working. If you Suppose now I only make this one small. You're still going to have the prob same problem. So you actually have to gradually go backwards. The same deal. You're going to balance out the delay gradually towards the end because this thing will, then this thing becomes the dominant factor and so on and so forth. So actually the better, distrib the best distribution is where you gradually go up to the middle and then you go back down in size. And that's going to balance everything out nicely. It's a good homework problem to figure that out. Okay. Good. Then that. Now, before I go to the next thing, um, um, let me ask you a, a, a another question a little bit. Um, actually, let's have a little intermezzo here. That's adders. But if you look at the project, um, I'm not only implementing adders. Actually, there's no single adder in the project. If you think about it, you have to do a subtraction, you have to do an absolute value, and you have to do a comparison. None of them directly is an addition. But they're very related to each other. Let's look at subtraction. I think it's, how would you do a subtraction? Uh, that's obviously the next question. So in order to understand it, you have to think a little bit about data representation. How do you represent a digital world? Well, typically we're going to use a representation which is called two's complement. Two's complement. Any, anybody of you never heard about two's complement? Representation you must see in 60C or something like that, somewhere that. Yeah. So two's complement is a positive word is written with a zero up front and then ones and zeros. If you want to get the negative number, what you do is invert all the bits and add one. So to get this, is, this number would be um, 32 plus 8 is 40, 42. Right? This is 42. To get minus 42, you do you invert all the bits and you add one. So you add one, this will become one, zero, 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 one, one. And that's the representation of minus 42. 
So a negative number always have the MSB equal to 1. Okay? All right. So how would I do subtraction? I have to compute now A minus B. Well, that's equal to A plus minus B. Okay? So I'm going to take B, compute the two's complement of B, and add it to A. So it's an adder. But there's one nasty little thing in here, the minus B part. If I take B and I want to get the negative, what do I have to do? I have to invert it and add 1. Now that add 1 is the nasty part because that's another addition. Uh, you can say, well, it's only 1, but it can ripple through the whole chain. So what will you do? How can I get around that? How can I make a single adder do subtraction? I just have to add 1. Yes? Could you put a 1 into the carry? That's right. Remember that first carry that we'd never do anything for with? This is where we had a half adder. We just, we just feed a 1 in there. And so what you have to do, the full adder cell now becomes like this. You have A and you have B. You put an inverter in front. This is A and B. And then you basically, in the beginning of the chain, you add a 1 instead of a 0. And you have a subtractor. So it's not much of a difference, uh, but it's um, already quite, um, um, it's a little s a subtle difference, but it shows that with an adder, without any extra delay, there's a little bit of extra delay here, there's an extra inversion, but that's it, I can do subtraction. So that's the first step. We're going to talk a, lot, a little bit about that beginning of lectures, next lecture as well. How would I do, think, start thinking about how would I do absolute value? That's the next thing to think about. How would I do comparison? Again, an interesting question to ask yourself, because these are the type of things we have to start thinking about when we do the project. But, uh, and the other thing to think about is, can I do better than square root out of n? Right? That's the next question. Square root of n is already pretty good. Is that the best possible adder I can get? Or can I do better? Actually, in the extreme case, can I have an adder where the delay is independent of number of bits? Would that be possible? That would be nice, right? Independent of a thousand bits and Boom. Same time as two bits adding. That would be really cool. Could you do that? Good question. Think about it a little bit. All right. So we'll be back uh, on Wednesday. So project is posted. So uh, you have a look. If you have